We're in 1 Thessalonians, right? If you watch the Veggie Tales, they call it Thessalupians. It's not that. It's Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You're like, where in the world is that? Well, after you go through the Gospels, you'll come to what's called the, the GEPC section of the Bible, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Right after you get through General Electric Power Company, you'll run right into 1 Thessalonians. That's a good way for you to remember it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 13 through 18 this morning. The, the title of the message is Looking for a Rest Stop. Remember, this whole sermon series is themed like a family traveling on vacation. And have you ever been traveling and, and it's like you ask somebody, ask your kiddos, hey, has anybody got to go to the restroom? They're like, no, I'm good, I'm good. And then all of a sudden you hit that stretch where there's not a rest stop for like 89 miles. And I won't share a fond memory that one of my daughters <laughs> has on the side of the road in Denver, Colorado. You can probably put that picture together, but I'm like, honey, we're nowhere and we got to go, right? Have you ever been there? That is akin to the journey in life. You're like, God, I'm okay right now. I'm okay right now. And the next thing you know, a diagnosis, a, a job difficulty, a, a stress, something happens in your life where you're like, Lord, I need this. Like, I don't want to leave this earth now, but Lord, it'd be okay if you, if you sounded the trumpet, right? Like, I need you to come. I, I need your trumpet to sound. We've all been there. So we're going to look at what is, what is referred to as the rapture. Now, listen, the event, if you will, the word rapture is not found in the Bible under like a title, the rapture. The word is, and we're going to get to that in just a moment, and I'm going to show you two of the four verses that at least reference it multiple times. But as we're looking at the rapture this morning, why is that important in terms of end times? Why is this tie, how does this tie into the book of Daniel, to the book of Revelation, and uh, the prophecies of Ezekiel, and, and all through the, the hope and anticipation of the book of, uh, of Thessalonians? So the, the, the church at Thessalonica, they had some problems. And Paul came through and was preaching, and in one moment, Paul was like, hey, listen, Christ is risen, and be looking for him. As he went, he'll come back. And they took that so seriously, they literally were like, they, they had their bags packed, like sitting at the curb, if you will, is how serious they had that. And Paul was like, not a one of you will die until Christ returns. Now, we know now, looking back, what he meant by that, like you're going to physically die, but you're not going to be eternally separated from him, like You'll either be with him when you pass in, in, in what's called heaven, Abraham's bosom, if you will, or he will return. But Paul didn't have time to explain that. Remember, this is all new doctrine for them. They're hearing this for the first time. Well, some of them die, and they're troubled, they're bothered, so they begin to write Paul, and they're like, hey, great sermon when you were here, but you said some of us wouldn't die. Well, we've had members that have now died. What's happened to them? And Paul has to write back and explain to them, let, let, me, let me clue you in on this, is what he's saying. And so this is the sort of the background that we find ourselves in. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 4, jump down, if you will, to verse 13. This is now the language, so you understand. This is the language that Paul is now using to explain to them, yes, some have died, but they're with the Lord because they were in Christ. But for those of us who remain... Here's what we can expect. So now, now that you know that, listen to the language. But we do not want you to be uninformed. Do you see that? That's why he's writing that. Other versions use the word ignorant. But we would not have you to be ignorant. In other words, he's trying to write back and say, okay, listen, I didn't have time to give you all of the story so, the, so that you're not uninformed. Let me give you the rest of the story. This is why you and I need to know this. So that you and I aren't sort of ignorant, uninformed in the end times. And we're going to give you some instructions here at the end of the sermon on how to be informed and, and what that looks like. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. That you may not, you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Do you see how he's explaining this to them? Verse 15, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So he answers their question, right? Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
And so we will always be with the Lord. I love that. And so we will always be with the Lord. Let me repeat that. And so we will always be with the Lord. Let me repeat that. (laughs) No matter where you find yourself. Thank you, Paul. And we will always be with the Lord, okay? You can never, you can't leave the presence of God. Even if you're a sinner, wherever you go, there is God. Do you not know that? But even better so, when you come to Christ, you were never left alone. He is always there with you. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. There it is. There's really the reason why we need to be informed so we can be an encouragement to those who do not know, who have no hope, and who are grieving. So there are three problems for those who do not know. This could include us, but predominantly he's speaking here to those who are lost, but sort of contextually we can apply this to us, which is why we're looking at this uh, end time topic, the rapture. Three problems for those who don't know. Number one, ignorance. Again, that's the word that is most often used in translations. It's in the ESV, we read the word uninformed. Listen, if you're uninformed, then that's when the devil can come in and try to form an opinion in your heart, your mind. You can't wake up and just say, okay, Lord, whatever you got for me, bring it. No, because whatever the Lord has, the devil has a counterfeit. You need to get up and say, okay, Lord, what is your specific word for me today? How do I know that? How do I verify that in your, in your word by the power of the Holy Spirit? Don't just wake up and say, okay, God, whatever today brings. No, the, the devil's now heard that announcement. You and I need to be informed on how God is moving in our life. Don't be uninformed. Number two, sorrow. He says that because you're uninformed, there are those that grieve, right? He literally uses the word grief. Have you not discovered that when, have you ever not... Have you ever run into a situation where you're like, oh man, I wish I would have known that ahead of time? And then there's some element of either grief or discouragement that you've experienced and you're like, if I would have known that, I would not have made this decision. That's exactly what he's referencing here. Number three, hopelessness. Hopelessness. All three of these you and I can experience if we are informed from the word of God because he says those who, are, who grieve as if they have no hope. Why do we study the end times? Why do we need to be informed about the rapture? Because it gives us hope. We do not have to grieve because we know we will always be with the Lord. And in knowing that, that keeps us informed on where we are. So let's look at the rapture. What are the events around it? There's six things that we can get from this scripture. Number one, there's the what. The what is is most specifically described. It's It's a heavenly mystery. The Bible tells us this. It's It's a heavenly mystery. Go back to verse 16 and 17 of chapter four. Watch this. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet him in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. It's a heavenly mystery. Like there's so much about it that we do know, but yet there's so much about it that we don't know. Remember that there are no times that sort of tell us, oh, here it is. We are, we're sort of living in those times or it can be at any moment. Now, remember, there are specific times of his second coming, which you're going to look at that in a few weeks. But there are no times that sort of predict, which is why you, if you ever hear somebody sort of date when Christ is going to return, don't. Believe that date. A date cannot be set. It is a heavenly mystery. In other words, the word rapture, as I I share with you, the event like that is not found under the subtitle, the the rapture. But nonetheless, the word here is harpazo. Now, why is that important? Because it means to be caught away. It it, it literally means to be caught up, like without notice, Uh, almost like now you see me, now you don't. I mean, literally, That's what that means. And here here are two references where we see uh, the the word rapture used. In Acts chapter 8, verse 39, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. Now, it's interesting. Philip was in town, and Jesus said, hey, there's a man traveling, and you need to go meet him. He's searching the scriptures, and it's now known as the Philip meets the Ethiopian man, and and Philip travels to meet him. And while he's coming, he recognizes that he's reading, the, the eunuch is reading from the book of Isaiah. Immediately, of course, Philip knows what he's reading, and he asks, you know, what does this verse mean? And begins to share faith in Christ. This man accepts Christ. He's baptized right there. And as soon as that event is over, the the unit looks around, and he's gone. Like, he's not just like, oh, wow, he really got away fast. It's like, I don't even see the guy. 
Like, can you imagine that, how, how wild that would be? Literally, this is where the word rapture caught up, taken away in a moment's notice. John chapter 6, verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of, the, of Galilee. In other words, he's there one minute talking to the disciples, and he says, I'm going to go to the other side. He didn't just jump in a boat. He's there. Like, immediately, he's caught up. This is the word rapture that is used. Rapture literally means to catch away speedily. Deliver, now watch this, this is important. Deliver from danger, take away from one place and deliver to another, okay? But remember, it's a mystery. Jesus refers to that, this time that you and I are in. It's a mystery is is something that's hidden that is yet to be revealed, and so here's what we know, number one, about the rapture. Number one, it is, a, it is a heavenly mystery. Only God understands, only God knows the hour, right? Not, in the, not even the angels or the son of man, but number one, it is a heavenly mystery. Number two, who? Well, the who, the, the who is a select multitude. I love the way one preacher described it years ago. I'll never forget reading this illustration of, of the who. And he said, it's almost like being in a, in, in a junkyard and there's the magnet that picks up the scrap. And the magnet only picks up scrap that is attracted to the magnet. Not even gold or silver Silver is picked up. Only the iron that matches the same iron in the magnet is attracted. Only those who are in Christ will be caught up, caught away, delivered from danger. It is the who is a select multitude. This is not a general resurrection. It's not those who've done good, who are good people, who've just gone to church, who've own the Bible and, and who, who thinks their life is good. No, it's those who've confessed faith in Christ. Like we can't ask this question enough and I haven't asked it lately and, and, and often. If you were to die tonight, are you 100% certain that you would be in heaven with Christ? Based upon your personal confession of sin, your recognition and need of Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you wouldn't stand there and say, well, God, I, I did some of these and I didn't do this. And overall, I've been a really good person and I went to church. Now, has there been a time in your life where your sin absolutely overwhelmingly broke your heart? And in response, you saw the answer was Jesus Christ and you cried out to him, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life in my heart. Receive me as your son or your daughter. Pour the power of the Holy Spirit within me and help me to live this thing called the Christian life. Has there ever been a moment? Because the Bible tells you and I that the way to destruction is broad, but the way to life is narrow. So just because you walk into a church does not make you a Christian. Just because you carry your Bible does not make you a follower of Christ. It is your personal confession. So you need to understand you could be standing beside somebody that goes, and you're like, well, wait, I went to church. No, that's not it. Right? It is, a, it is not a general resurrection. It is for those who are reborn. Listen to the book of the Revelation, chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. The Bible tells us the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is what we know in the book of Revelation. We know that it will be those who are, who are called to faith in Christ, those who have placed their faith in Christ. And by way, there are two resurrections, as you know. There's going to be the resurrection of those who trusted Christ during the tribulation period. But listen to Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. He says this, as soon as I can find verse 5. There it is. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power but they will be priests of God, of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. It is a select multitude. How do we know these things about the rapture? Say, so how can we even understand these things? Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verses 14 and 15 one more time. For since we believe, watch, that Jesus died and rose again. You might want to underline that. Even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you, watch, by a word from the Lord. Right there in those two verses, we get two ways that we know this about the rapture. Number one, we know this because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Because Jesus Christ was resurrected, you and I know that when we reach death, because of our faith placed in Christ, we too will be raptured, if you will. You and I will will escape physical, uh, eternal death, separation from God. Number two, how do we know this? By the word of the Lord. This is why I'm telling you every Sunday, you have to get into the word of God. How are we informed by the word of God? How do we know these things? By the word of God. How can you and I not be ignorant? How can we be informed? Well, number one, understand what we know about Christ, that he is God's son, that he walked on this earth, that he submitted himself to the Father's will, that he went to the cross, he was crucified, he did die, he was buried, he is risen, he will come back for you and I. And just as he is risen, so you and I will rise to meet him in the air. How do we know that? By the word of the Lord. How is it you know how to approach the end times? By getting into the word of God. How do you and I even wake up tomorrow morning and face tomorrow morning of just traveling to work, of, of doing our job, of, of trying to be a mom or a dad or a student or, or in a marriage or a family, right? How do we know that? By getting in the word of God. But what is the rapture for? It's for the select multitude, those who have confessed faith in Christ. Number three, when? When? Well, obviously we don't know a date, but we, this is what we do know. It's a sudden moment. Gosh, it's, it's, listen to how the Bible describes it. The Bible says it's a sudden moment. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That, by the way, is a newborn baby's verse. But anyway, uh, you'll get that in just a moment. We will not all sleep, but we will, our diapers will be changed. Anyway, you'll get that in a moment. It's a, it's a verse over a lot of nurseries. Anyway, moving on. The Bible says that we shall not all sleep. I mean, literally, like your body may lie in a casket, but you didn't fall asleep. You literally just took one breath on this earth and took the next breath in heaven. That's when you die. And if you're raptured, you're you're literally one moment you're walking this earth and the next minute there's no sleep, right? You're you're caught up in the air. The, The time is near. If you will look over to Matthew chapter 24, turn over to Matthew chapter 24. These verses will be there. I'm going to read them sort of fast. So Matthew 24, verse 33. So also when you see all these things, you will know that he is near. He is at the very gates. If you're following, jump down to verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Listen to this. Now jump down to verse 42. This is why the sermon series is called Wake Up. Therefore, stay awake. See, you're not going to sleep. Like literally, therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Jump down to verse 44. Therefore, you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Somebody documented, I don't know who, but somebody documented, listen, that we blink 20,000 times a day. The Bible says, faster than you blink your eyes. Christ is coming. What does that also tell you? That tells me, and t- t- that tells me that there's 20,000 chances a day that Christ could return. He narrowed it down to an hour, right? I just said 20,000 times in a day. But here's what we know. It is a sudden moment. But be reminded of this. Please get this. Signs are primarily for what happens after the rapture. Signs are primarily for what happens after the rapture. We must be ready at any moment. Yeah. I want to I give you a verse that's not on your screen because I, I know there are some in, that, that believe different. There are some that believe, and it is, it is debated. There are some that believe the, that the, Christ, the Christians will be here during the tribulation period. And they, there's some that believe in pre. There's some that believe in, in mid. And there's some that believe in post. Um, here's an answer that will satisfy everybody. Uh, you can actually be a pan-millennialist. In other words, It'll all pan out in the end, like no matter which end you go, we're all going to go to Christ. But for those that that have difficulty understanding this, right, I want to give you a verse. Listen to Revelation, and you can write this down, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, 
and for 10,000 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. I will give you the crown of life. So he's telling the church there, the, the, the church at Smyrna, he's, he's literally telling them, look, you're about to go through suffering. And he uses the word tribulation. Well, the church has been in suffering and tribulation ever since Jesus Christ left the earth. The tribulation that's about to be unleashed, which is about four or five sermons from now when we get into that, is nothing like what you and I are experiencing now. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. The Bible refers to the, the rapture, that day of the Lord. He refers to it as our blessed hope. If I know that the Bible has told me that that day is a day of hope that Christ is returning, and if the Bible tells me that rapture means to deliver away from danger or harm, then why in the world would the Bible tell you and I that we are going to go through the tribulation? We're not. Literally, to be raptured out of, literally means God tells us in his word, he is not going to allow us to go through such danger. He will remove his church from it. Why did he, not, why did he do it with Noah and the ark? Why did he do it with Rahab and, and, and Joshua? Or why did he do it with so many saints to, in the Old Testament? Those are pictures of what it means to be in Christ. God would not allow you and I to go through tribulation. In other words, if we did, you and I would pray, even so come coffin. We would pray for death so we could immediately be in heaven. But the Bible tells you and I to pray for even so come Lord. It doesn't tell us to look forward to a coffin. It tells us to look forward to a Christ. If I knew that I had to go through the tribulation, I'd pray to die right now. But I'm not praying for a coffin. I'm praying for a Christ. Amen? So here's what you and I need to understand. This will happen in a sudden moment, which is why he tells you and I to be ready, to be awake. Number four, why? Why, why, even, why, why even be this? Why even talk about the rapture? Well, here's why. It is a promised protection. I've already alluded to that. The rapture is a promised protection slash collection. It's a protection of the saints. It's a collection of saints. If you'll listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. That's why, the tribula that's why the rapture precedes the tribulation. God would not have you and I. We're going to go through suffering, but he's delivering us from the tribulation that is to come. That number one, that first word there is rescue. You, you see it. It's, it's rescue. It's rescue from this world as we know. Remember, remember the, the sculpture, the, the statue that Daniel had in his vision? It started at gold and ended with clay. That's a very fragile structure. Can you not see how fragile our world is today and how more and more fragile our world is becoming day by day, year by year? We know this world is coming to a collapse. We know that, which is why Christ is coming to Christ because he is the only stone that comes in and crashes the structure and becomes the stone, the mountain, the kingdom of God that is installed forever and ever and ever. But what is this rapture about? Why do we need to be informed about it? It is, it is rescue for you and I. This is why he ends that, that chapter, that verse in chapter four, where he says, and therefore encourage one another for this. You and I are gonna face criticism. We're gonna face persecution. We're gonna face difficulty. We're going to be belittled. Missionaries, unfortunately, I'm praying for them, right? That we're, we're gonna face that type of persecution but this is what we know. Encourage one another in this because at that moment when Christ chooses to return, you and I are going to be rescued. Why? Because number two, it is a reunion. It is a reunion. Listen to 1 Thessalonians one more time. Chapter four, verse 17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air kind of phenomenal. Our, our uh, house was sort of a pathway um, for, I guess, warm-up for the uh, air and space show um, that was yesterday. And so I'm outside, and all of a sudden I hear this loud, and I'm like, what in the world is that? Like, that's a really low Southwest jet, you know, because I'm thinking that's the only thing that flies over. And I look up, and it's these tandem, you know, F-22s, and, and it's, they're, they're part of the show. And I'm outside, and I'll be honest, I was, can I, can I tell this? 
I was outside and I was waving him in the yard. I was like, can you see me? I, I had to look like a fool. I had my binoculars out. I was like, America. I mean, I was screaming. I was shouting, right? And they did, they did this pattern over and over and over. They, over and over and over they flew. And then I guess they got tired of me because one time they, they went, I said, well, okay, bye guys. Like, you know, and so forth. What's my point in all that? I was, as I was looking up at that, I was like, man, there's going to be a day when all of a sudden you and I are the greatest air and space show ever. <laughs> I'm thinking, wow, there are these two planes that are flying over. And it's fun. Can you just see the, in, the, in the entire world, yeah. all the Christians at the blink of an eye? <laughs> Can you just imagine that? And we're up there high five because the Bible says it's a reunion. We're up there high fiving each other like, we did it. We're out of here. And, and, and I am praying, I am praying, I am around those people that don't like worship. That's what I'm praying. I'm praying, I seriously am. I'm praying to be around those people that worship like this. Singing holy God almighty. I'm like, those people, are, if they're not happy, I'm like, oh man, are you sure about them? You know, Because you're in there like, I did it, I did it, I did it. It's going to be a reunion. Number three, it's going to be a reception. It's going to be a reception. We often preach these verses at funerals, but it's, it's, it's not that at all. John chapter 14, verses one through six. Let not your hearts be troubled. Who needs to hear that this morning? I'm serious. You woke up with a troubled heart. We will in this world. Therefore, encourage one another. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Man, is that not just like a few word sermon right there? Done, like close the Bible. Like there's the answer, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. You see, heaven's not about going to your mansion, which I know you all wanna see it, right? And I'm praying, Lord, don't put me beside Billy Graham because in heaven I'll regret how small my mansion is. But anyway... <laughs> right? I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. How many times have you longed to be right by Jesus? This is why we need to be informed about the rapture. And you know the way I'm going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Goodness gracious, that's a whole nother sermon in itself, amen? Here's what we know, the why. It is a promised protection and collection because it's rescue, reunion, and it's reception. Number five, where? Where? Well, we know this. The Bible tells us it is a visible, heavenly gathering. Like there are times when I look up, one of the planes that flew over, I don't know the model, but it was ginormous, like I was literally outside in the yard mowing and I just shut the mower off and I ran inside and I'm like, you gotta come outside. Like, look how big this thing is. And I'm watching this thing go over and I'm like, how in the world is something that big staying up, right? And that was just one airplane. Again, can you imagine the skies filled with the followers of Christ? It's a visible, like those who are not in Christ are going to see you and I meeting Christ in the air. It is a visible, heavenly gathering. The Bible literally uses the words in the air. This is what we know. Now, one of the cool things is when you study the Bible, it, it cross-references you to so many other things. And one of the cross-references it takes you to is this meeting in the air is referred to as a bride and a groom. And if you study uh, the sort of New Testament uh, wedding, let me just read this to you. A groom would typically go to the bride's house, negotiates a deal to purchase the price, and somebody at my house the other day said $10 million, so I'm waiting on that payment to come in, but they know who they are. Negotiates a deal to purchase the bride. <laughs> he purchases the price. The couple recites an oath as a blessing of the union. The groom then goes away. He prepares a place for them. She gets ready for his return. At the time set by the groom and the father of the groom, he returns. Then with a call to the bride, he asks for her to come away with him. 
Isn't that awesome? This is what the Bible's talking about. You and I will one day meet the Lord in the air. Well, why is this all important? I use the word wherefore. Actually, the word is therefore, but you can use either one. But I tried to stay with all W's, right? Uh, and, and so wherefore. Why do we need to know? Because it's a word of encouragement. It is a word of encouragement. I want to break this down to you, and let's finish this. Let, let me give you sort of uh, four reasons, four comforts for knowing the rapture and, and why this should uh, prompt us to live the faith that we have. Let, let's just go back to the beginning to give you four comforts. Number one, be educated. Now, we've sort of already gone over that, but he literally tells you and I to not be uninformed. Listen, I know your day is busy. And I have the privilege and the calling and the blessing to, to come in here every day of the week and set aside time to study the word. Like, I get that. And I've often asked myself, and, I, and I, I name certain names because I know certain lifestyles and I know how busy people are. And I'm like, if I were them, would I be able to dedicate as much time to study in the word? And to be honest with you, the answer is yes and no. Because I know how many of you work 12, 13 hour days and many I've talked to put in 50, 60, sometimes 70 hour weeks in certain jobs and, and you still have kiddos and the demands of life and, and you, you're up here and you hear me tell you get in the word and, and I hear, because this is what you, you say back to me and I love it. You're like, Pastor Ron, I want to get into the word, but when I come home, I'm so exhausted or when I get up in the morning, it's this and that and, and I get it, I get it. Trust me, I understand. But the only way you and I are going to make it through those 13-hour days and 70-hour weeks is getting in the Word of God. Get in the Word of God. Start. You say, many ask, well, how do, how do I start? I say, well, you know, there's easy ways to start. If you're new to the Bible, start with the Gospel of John. Start in the New Testament. Start with the Gospel of John. Then, if you will, read a, read a proverb a day is what I tell people. Read a proverb a day. And to be honest with you, they're, they're so fast that you'll find yourself reading four or five a day. And then jump over to the Psalms. Read at least a portion of a Psalm a day. That's a good place to start. Say, where do I start reading the Bible? Read the Gospel of John. Read a proverb a day and then start in the Psalms. As you finish John and you're still working through maybe the Proverbs and you're certainly still working through the Psalms, jump on over to the book of James. When you finish the book of James, then come back and read the book of Galatians and then go into Ephesians, then go into Philippians and then go into Colossians. Do not start out in Leviticus. And do not start out in Revelation. Don't. I'm just, right? And I know right now you're going to go home like wet paint. Don't touch. What's in Leviticus? <laughs> right? I get it. But get in the word. I'm telling you, just five minutes a day will change the trajectory of your entire day. That is how powerful the word of God is. You need to be informed. And trust me, there are more people out there that aren't followers of Christ that know more about the Bible than followers of Christ. And in a world where church attendance is declining, you need to know truth and how to share it with people who don't. Today's modern day disciples are Google, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. I'm telling you, those are today's four gospels. And people know more about that than they do the original gospels. In order for you to show people there's truth out there, you must, number one, be educated yourself. How? Why, what, what do I need to know about this? Wherefore? How do I be encouraged? Number two, be invested. Be invested. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we declare... We declare this to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of a trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be called up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always, so we will always, so we will always, so we will always be with the Lord. Be invested. Listen, the devil knows the areas of your life where you're not invested. And he will invest augmented reality. He will invest solutions. He will invest opinions. He will invest energy into the areas where you're not invested. And so you and I have to constantly be protected by our investment. What do you mean by that? Is this like a Charles Schwab thing? No, that's not what I mean by investment. I mean, number one, 
Put your face in the word of God. Become a person of prayer. Get involved in the local church. I can't tell you this enough. One of the most powerful forces on this earth, one of the restraining forces of evil right now is the local church. You want to be protected? Get in the body of Christ. Get it and start serving. Don't just attend. Start serving. You're like, I don't know where to serve. I, I can't sing. I can't speak. That's what most people think are the top two things that all churches do. No, you, 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 there's so many places where you are needed to serve. Be invested because where you're not invested, trust me, you're not protected. Number three, be encouraged. Like the Bible tells you and I that, that of all the people that should not have their head in the sand, but their head looking up to the sky, feet on the ground, but head looking up, it's Christians. Of all the people that ought to be encouraged and encouraging, it ought to be Christians. I say this so often, I think it is an embarrassment to God to be a sourpuss Christian. I really do. I, people, I, I'm a believer, I just love God and I love going to church. I'm like, oh man, I don't want to go to that church, right? No, no. Listen, be encouraged. Yes, you're going to have discouragement as, as, as believers. Yes, you're going to be discouraged as followers of Christ. But of all the people that ought to have a smile on their face, you want to know that there's one day coming that I'm going to meet Jesus Christ. It is either by death or by air, but either way I win. There is no loss for me. There is no loss for me because in Christ... I am an overcomer. That's why we sang the songs that we sang this morning, to remind you of all those truths. Be encouraged. And here's the last one, right? Be ready. He tells us that. Be ready. Be ready at a moment's notice. You've heard the stories before. What if the trumpet sounded and you were a place you shouldn't be? What if the trumpet sounded and you were consuming, watching, participating, talking, laughing, and something that you shouldn't be in. You see, you and I are to, to be ready at any moment. It's ridiculous, I know. It's ridiculous, I know. But let's, can we do this together? Can we blink together? One, two, three, blink. That fast. And there's 20,000 blinks when he could return. It's what you and I do with our life between the blinks. He literally's telling you and I to be ready. That's the whole sermon series. Wake up. Be ready. He's coming at a moment's notice. And how often are you and I made aware of that? But unfortunately, we're made, of it, made aware of it at times that we really don't want to be made aware of it. When death comes to the door, when a diagnosis by a doctor is received, when we lose our job, when something happens when you and I are like, wait, what? Stop. Hang on. What's going on? Right? Then we're reminded no, you and I should be ready, watch this, because we're constantly encouraged because of our investment of being in the Word of God. The more you are in the Word, the more you are protected, which makes it easier for you to be encouraged, which constantly allows you to be ready. These are four comforts. I'm telling you, our world needs them, amen? Even so come, Lord Jesus, even so come. We will either meet him by death, if you will, separation from this world and, and, and a reunion with him, or we will meet him in the air when the trumpet sounds. Either way, we win. But I want to make sure your faith and your hope and your trust is placed in Christ this morning.